1949, an 11-year-old boy is forced to spend a whole year in a Quebec City hospital. Gabriel Labbé is battling tuberculosis. On a cold November night, a small kindness changes his life forever. One of the sisters told me, I'll lend you a radio and I want you to listen to the hockey game. There is one name you will hear more often than others. He's the best. His name is Maurice Richard. For Gabriel, it's the beginning of a love story. Michel Normandin's voice carries him off to the Montreal Forum, and a whole new world opens up to him. The next day, the sister came to get her radio and she said, Gabriel, how did you like the hockey game? I threw my arms around her neck, I hugged her and said, Richard scored three goals. She was really happy. From that first magical moment, Gabriel Labbé joins the hundreds of thousands of fans who worship Maurice Richard, the man known as the Rocket, a name that will resound for generations in the heart and soul of a whole nation. As the country emerges from the Second World War, Canadians face a very different reality. A challenger from the East threatens Canada's hockey supremacy. Asian and black players try to break into the NHL and find the door shut tight. And a small box transforms the country's sport forever, igniting what will become a national obsession. In 1953, the war has been over for eight years now, and times are good. There are jobs aplenty, there's a building boom, and people are spending. Hockey arenas are packed to the rafters. These are deeply conservative times. Women are expected to be homemakers, and men, the breadwinners. In Quebec, the influence of the Catholic Church is everywhere. The National Hockey League is a closed shop of six teams. Montreal, Detroit, Boston, New York, Chicago, and Toronto. The Toronto Maple Leafs' reign is coming to an end. The 1950s will see a fierce rivalry between the Montreal Canadiens and the Detroit Red Wings. And two players, both larger than life, both number nine, Maurice Richard and Gordie Howe, electrify the fans and spark hockey's most passionate debate. They were both working class guys. They're both products of, of the depression. They, they both wear number nine. They both play the same position and they played with a different style. Howe's game was, was one of power. He would just lug the puck to the net and slam it in the back of the net as, as hard as he could. Richard's game was uh, from the blue line in. I've still never seen anything like it. It was one of great color and flamboyance and ferocity. For Gabriel Labbé, there's no doubt, Maurice Richard is the greatest. Four years after getting out of hospital, Gabriel is having the time of his life on a pond not far from the family home. He not only beat TB, but also polio. He can't skate, but he won't be beaten down. His hero's example fuels his own determination and courage. I was often sick, and I had to struggle. And every time, I would think about him. I would tell myself, be like Maurice. Don't give up, never give up. 
Gabriel is mesmerized by Richard's fieriness. No other player is as spectacular. He is unstoppable. He charges, dekes, he fights, and he's the one who scores the winner in overtime. This is a man seized by a single obsession, to score goals. His opponents can't help but admire the way he does it. The rocket pulverizes record after record. 45 goals in a single season, 50 goals in 50 games, and he's the first player to score more than 325 goals. This strong, silent man is winning the hearts of fans all over the country. In back alleys and on local rinks, children imitate the rocket. They create their own shrine to this great, conquering hero. From all parts of the country, Richard gets presents and fan mail. I have great admiration for you, and I would like one day to be like you. I'm sending you a picture of my little brother Jean-Marc and me with our favorite canoe. I'm going hunting next week and I'll do my best to kill a few partridges and send them to you as a gift, if that would please you. Maurice Richard's fame has no borders. He is welcomed like a hero in Prague. And he's news in the Soviet Union. Tonight is the first anniversary. Ed Sullivan, host of the highest rated variety show in the U.S., introduces him as the most popular athlete in Canada. Maurice Richard, would you stand up there and take a bow, please? In Quebec, this son of the working class is almost a god. Suddenly, one of us was doing something great, and all of us we were feeling that we too could do something great. A rocket Richard came uh, in a time when French Canadians were not feeling very good about themselves. They had not many reasons to be proud of themselves. And they were feeling that they were victims of history, of politics. They were not feeling like winners. And there was this hockey player. He was the best. He was scoring and nobody could stop him. Puck is dropped, it bounces over the line to Howe. Howe getting his shot! He shoots, he scores! But there's another number nine in the hockey kingdom, and he's on a mission to break the Rockets records. Legions of young fans begin cheering for Gordy Howe, the shy, gentle man who becomes a terror on ice. Jim Van Tour, an 11-year-old Albertan, identifies completely with his hero. He looked like sort of a classic prairie boy. He was a big, strong kid, not very well educated, but humble, willing to sign autographs. In addition to being such a fabulous hockey player, he just seemed like such a nice person. In 1950, just as his career is taking off, Gordy Howe has a brush with death. The young Red Wings star goes headfirst into the boards and crashes to the ice. He was out cold and people were all around him, and he was bleeding. It was the talk among myself and my friends. It was pretty tragic. People thought that he would never play again. In fact, some people thought he wasn't gonna make it. Hal makes it back from emergency surgery, and the very next season, he becomes Richard's greatest rival. He sets his own record, winning the Art Ross Trophy as the league's scoring leader four years in a row. Dazzled by his hero, young Jim Van Tour wants to be number nine on his team. He gets his wish. I was on top of the world. 
I can remember very clearly how thrilled I was to get number 9 because I thought that meant I was the best player on the team. Or if I wasn't, I was going to be. I can't lie. I was such a Gordie Howe uh, fan that... Listen, how many times when you were a kid, you're in your backyard or you're on the pond and you scored a goal, or, you know, you'd be playing with a buddy and you'd say, oh, here we are, game seven, and Stanley Cup final, and you score the goal, and Gordie Howe, Detroit Red Wings, Stanley Cup champions. The amazing thing was you had the same excitement when you were a kid at eight doing it as when it actually really happened. Jim Van Tour knows everything there is to know about Gordie Howe. One day, he sneaks into the Red Wings dressing room. Gordie Howe and Ted Lindsay were sitting together side by side. He just said hi, and he asked me if I played hockey, and I said yes, and he sort of said, good for you, and signed my book, and that was it. I was in heaven. I couldn't believe that I was actually standing face to face with Gordie Howe. Jim Van Tour is convinced that Howe is the greatest. Gabriel Labbe is just as sure that no one can match Maurice Richard. That's what made them both great, is that they probably uh, benefited from each other in a sense that they had so much pride and they wanted to win so badly that it pushed them to, to really be competitive against each other for their particular teams. Howe's resilience will make him the greatest survivor in the history of pro hockey, with a career that spans nearly half a century. Maurice Richard will become the first player to break the magic 500 gold barrier. And more than that, he'll become a symbol for a new generation of French Canadians. Bonsoir, mesdames, mesdemoiselles, messieurs. On assiste ce soir au Forum de Montréal à l'une de ces luttes typiques entre Détroit et Canadiens. Jamais, il me semble, nos commanditaires n'auraient pu choisir meilleur parti pour nos débuts à la télévision. Saturday, October 11th, 1952. Radio-Canada, the French network of the CBC, broadcasts the first televised hockey game on Canadian television. The very first hockey night in Canada comes from the Forum in Montreal. The broadcast is directed by Gérald Renault. Look, hockey was so popular, and this was the dawn of television. It was obvious that hockey would become an extraordinary television spectacle. I never doubted it for a minute. Soon after, it's Toronto's turn. A great Canadian tradition is born. Across the country, families can actually see their heroes and new stars like Big Jean Beliveau. Few can afford their own sets, so fans gather outside store windows to watch with awe Boom Boom Jeffrion's slap shot. Detroit coming in again. Here's a shot right off. Rhoda, kick that to the side. Others congregate in neighborhood bars to watch live Ted Kennedy's grit and determination. We were young enough that whatever we saw, uh, you know, was sort of magic. And, and anything coming out of a television screen was magic anyway. It's not just the player on the ice but it's seeing the lines, it's, you know, the, the logos, the crowd, hearing the crowd. Connecting the voice of Foster Hewitt to the game that was going on. For the best, I mean for the best. Murray Westgate, the friendly Imperial SO dealer. Like this. Tonight, Carl Voss, referee in chief of the NHL. How did you uh, feel? The hot stove in between periods. Well, to look back, I'm 25. The whole package of it you know, was so big and so exciting. Koski, Stove and McIntyre will likely be the scoring play. And it's 1905, a Chicago second goal, making it five to two. Television commentators keep viewers on the edge of their seats. They become as famous as the players. 
On the CBC, Foster Hewitt has switched to television after 20 years of play-by-play -play on the radio. Taylor right in front of the desk. He's right in. He's good. Taylor from Kreiner. And that makes it three to nothing. On Radio Canada, René Le Cavalier's smooth delivery helps refine the quality of spoken French in Quebec. Hockey Night in Canada spurs the sale of television sets, but its success is a crippling blow to junior and senior hockey leagues. Just two years after the first televised game, Tommy Gorman, general manager of the semi-professional Ottawa Senators team, is forced to close shop. We have no choice in the matter but to withdraw from the Quebec League without further delay, as the televising of the Saturday night programs from the Maple Leaf Gardens has completely ruined our attendances. It is with great regret that we will be forced to suspend operations. It's probably the first time in the memory of living man that the capital city, once known as the cradle of hockey, has been without a senior club of some kind, amateur or professional. The Ottawa Citizen, December 21st, 1954. They hold it against the boards. It goes loose again. Sloan going in on the left side, cutting right in on goal, and Rollins. Television establishes the NHL as the undisputed king of the hill and turns hockey into a national obsession. Hockey Night in Canada is the highest rated show of the 1950s and remains the longest running program in the history of Canadian television. In 1955, Montreal is to all appearances an English city. The Anglophone elite controls the economy. French Canadians are struggling to find their place. Maurice Richard is their pride and hope. He's the one who will bring the Stanley Cup back to Montreal. But that won't happen this year. On March 13th, 1955, a brutal encounter sets off a series of events that will make history. That night in Boston, Maurice Richard goes for defenseman Hal Laco, who has just hit him over the head with his stick. Enraged, blood dripping from his scalp, Richard lashes out at anyone trying to restrain him. In his anger, he punches a linesman and is thrown out of the game. The reason he explodes is that he has again and again been prevented from playing hockey as well as he can because referees have not enforced the rules properly. Just two months before, Montrealer Hugh McLennan, one of English Canada's best writers, had commented about the rocket. Every great player must expect to be marked closely. But for 10 years, the rocket has been systematically heckled by rival coaches who know intuitively that nobody can more easily be taken advantage of than a genius. Richard can stand any amount of roughness that comes naturally with the game. But after a night in which he has been cynically tripped, slashed, held, boarded, and verbally insulted by lesser men, he is apt to go wild. Three days after the fight in Boston, NHL President Clarence Campbell hands down a harsh sentence. It is a type of conduct which cannot be tolerated by any player, star or otherwise. In the result, Richard will be suspended from all games, both league and playoff, for the balance of the current season. Quebec is in a state of shock. Without the rocket, the Canadians now have little hope of winning the Stanley Cup. Richard was also on the verge of claiming the year's scoring championship. Despite all his goals, this is one award that he's never won and he wants it badly. March 17, 1955, St. Patrick's Day, the day after Campbell's decision. Demonstrators gather in front of the Montreal Forum. Guy Robinson shows up with his two brothers. We left for the forum with a big bag of tomatoes. There was a larger crowd than usual outside. Some people had signs. 
We got in with our bag of tomatoes, put it down at our feet, and watched the game. Now, suddenly, the game doesn't matter. NHL President Clarence Campbell makes his way to his seat. The man who has suspended Maurice Richard for this game and for the entire playoffs has dared to show up here in front of the Canadians' fans. So we started throwing tomatoes at Campbell. Tomatoes were flying in all directions. We were hitting people, but unfortunately, we weren't hitting Campbell. So my brother Andre got mad. He went right up to Campbell and threw a tomato at him. The police are ready, and now they move. Suddenly, someone throws a tear gas bomb. As the crowd rushes for the exits, the players head to their dressing rooms. The game is forfeited to Detroit. It was suffocating. Then we ran down the stairs quickly, and on the way down, we could see some shoes and some hats. Then people started to panic, really panic. We came out onto St. Catherine Street. A crowd had stopped some streetcars and a newsstand was on fire. It was total chaos. The crowd's anger burns for almost six hours. Peace is not restored in the city until dawn. Quebec has just experienced a defining moment in its long history. When Rocket Richard was punished by Clarence Campbell, it was happening in the context where there had been many strikes in textile business, in coal business, in the asbestos business, and those strikes have been very, very violent. And French Canadians did not win, the strikers did not win. And suddenly there was this hero Rocket being punished by Clarence Campbell. Clarence Campbell became like the pattern, like the metaphor for a boss. And the population revolted, not only because the rocket had been punished, but because they were revolting against this pattern of an English-speaking boss. In this great game of hockey to which we lay claim, there are heroes not near and afar. But the mightiest name in our national game is Maurice the Rocket Richard. When we need a man to encourage the fans, he'll shatter all records galore. In fact, with the cream of the Montreal team as Maurice the Rocket Richard. The Montreal Canadiens didn't win the championship that year, but Maurice Richard gets his revenge. The very next year, he leads his team to the Cup. And he wasn't done yet. With the Rocket as their leader, the Canadians will win five consecutive Stanley Cups, a feat unmatched to this day. In the 1950s, the first wave of baby boomers steps out on the ice. Many of the girls of this generation want to play hockey. In Saint Augustin de Mirabel, just north of Montreal, young Giselaine Etier takes her first steps on the ice. I go with my little brother out in the field where the rising water had frozen. And there, on that frozen, flooded field, we take turns wearing the skates and we push a little sleigh around. And that's how I learned to skate. Soon, Giselaine Etier discovers a passion for hockey. In her village, she's always the only girl on the team. Some mothers were upset because I was taking their boy's place. One boy's mother said, it's not normal for a girl to be playing here. It should be my boy. I didn't care. I just wanted to play, so I played. Nobody could have stopped me from playing. Well, I think what girls did who really wanted to play is they, they snuck into boys' leagues or they played shinny hockey in outdoor rinks. 
Uh, and that was about it. There were so few possibilities because there just wasn't anything for young girls. It was, it was pretty sad, pretty tragic, given that it was the national sport. In 1956, the Little Toronto Hockey League is recruiting young boys to fill their roster. Ab Hoffman is determined to play, and that means a little side trip first. I went and got my hair cut. I wore my hair quite short, but I went and got it cut even shorter in order to play. Ab Hoffman is chosen to play defense for the St. Catherine Teepees and becomes one of the team's best players. No one catches on that Ab is really Abigail, an eight-year-old girl. I think I was a good skater. I skated a lot near my house. I was just kind of fit and kind of sure of myself when it came to sort of athletic type things. Abigail plays for the teepees for more than three months. She is so talented that she has selected over 400 boys for the league's all-star team. Her secret is found out when someone asks to see her birth certificate. Mr. Graham, as chairman of the league, what was your reaction? Well, I was absolutely amazed. I just didn't believe it possible that we had a little girl amongst 400 boys in our league. Overnight, Abby Hoffman becomes a star. She gets more coverage than the NHL's top guns. She creates such a stir that there is even talk of setting up a league just for girls. What do you think of all this uh, fuss that's been created about you? I think it's a lot of nonsense. Soon the media moves on to other stories and interest fades. The idea of a hockey league for girls comes to nothing. And the next season, girls are officially banned from playing on boys teams. Nine-year-old Abigail Hoffman is forced to hang up her skates. Abigail Hoffman takes up track and field and becomes one of the country's top athletes proudly representing Canada internationally and at the Olympic Games. Abby Hoffman's courage becomes a lasting inspiration for female hockey players. Since 1982, the Abby Hoffman Cup has been awarded annually to the best senior women's hockey team in Canada. In 1948, Larry Kwong realizes his biggest dream and suffers his biggest disappointment. Kwong is the leading scorer with the New York Rovers when he's called by the New York Rangers to play in the NHL. His big night comes, but he ends up spending most of the game on the bench. It's pure agony. All I wanted to do was play hockey. They only gave me a minute on the ice. What can you do in a minute? You can't even get warmed up. I felt that wasn't too good a chance to give me, so I decided to leave them. But that single minute on the ice with the Rangers makes history. Kwong is the first person of Asian background to play in the NHL, at the time still very much a select white man's club. At about the same time, a player with the Sherbrooke St. Francis gets a long-awaited invitation. Dear Mr. Carnegie, this to advise you that you are to report on Tuesday, September 14, 1948, to the New York Rangers Hockey Club's training camp. I could hardly read it and trembled as tears of joy blurred my vision. At last, my day had arrived. For 10 years, I had been preparing myself both mentally and physically for this opportunity. Toronto-born Herb Carnegie is already a big name in the small industrial towns of Quebec and Ontario. By day, Carnegie works in the mines, but in the evening, he's the star on the local hockey circuit. For 10 years, he's dreamed of making it to the NHL. Herb Carnegie plays on a line with his brother Ozzy and Manny McIntyre, the three of them get a lot of attention. All across the country, the newspapers are talking about the famous colored line. Everybody wants to see them. The forum wants to have them, but they'll play in Sherbrooke, 
It's the top attraction in all of hockey. The Sherbrooke Tribune, November 16th, 1945. They were unique. The colored line, the black line. Everybody was talking about them. Everywhere Sherbrooke went, they were the main attraction. Playing for the Sherbrooke St. Francis, the black line becomes a sensation. Frederick Zakabe is a big fan. Herb Carnegie, it was a real delight to watch him play. He'd carry the puck and no one could take it away from him. He'd skate through any team. Nobody could stop him. Carnegie becomes one of the best players in the Quebec Senior Hockey League. He's voted his team's most valuable player two years in a row. In the fall of 1948, Herb Carnegie is 28 years old, and now he's getting ready for the New York Rangers training camp. Carnegie knows he has what it takes to play in the NHL. I had a wonderful training camp. I skated well. I passed the puck well. I scored a few goals. Playing the way I played, if I was a white person, I would have been in the NHL. No questions asked. No discussion, period. But the Rangers offer him a contract with the farm team, and for less money than he's making in Sherbrooke. Carnegie is outraged, and he turns it down. Herbie Carnegie, l'un des rares joueurs noirs à faire sa marque dans le hockey organisé, déclenche une belle montée pour les arts. Carnegie moves on and now plays with the Quebec Aces. And one day, he welcomes a rookie, a kid named Bellevaux. Herbie était un grand monsieur. Il était, non seulement par son jeu, mais son comportement, très apprécié par la population de Québec. Il était, quoi, dix ans plus âgé que moi. J'ai certainement appris des choses de lui par de la façon qu'il se comportait. Herbie, euh, sur la glace, était un, un joueur assez spectaculaire, un bon manieur de bâton. On avait parlé peut-être qu'il irait jouer avec les Rangers de New York, mais ça ne s'est jamais produit. Il était noir. Est-ce que ça lui a nuit? Il y en a qui prétendent, d'autres non. Jean Beliveau will graduate from the Aces to become a legend with the Montreal Canadiens. But for Herb Carnegie, there is no next step. He'll never make it to the NHL. Here's a man, a gentleman, plays the game as well as anyone else. And the thing is this, they're saying to you, everything is equal here. All the opportunities, all you need to do is be qualified. You're qualified, you're knocking at the door. You can get in, and yet there's a sport, national sport of Canada. What do you have to do to get in? If Herb Carnegie cannot make it, what does a black man have to do to get through this door? It will be another 10 years before the door finally opens. In 1958, Willie O'Ree is signed by Boston and plays 45 games with the Bruins. Hockey has earned the distinction of being the last major professional sport to integrate black athletes. Nineteen fifty four. The Cold War has divided the world between East and West. Communism versus capitalism. A time of fear and paranoia. At the World Hockey Championship in Stockholm, history is about to be made. A challenger is out to destroy Canada's supremacy. Canadians have never faced such an opponent. It's the dawn of a legendary rivalry. This is the first time the Soviets have played in an international tournament and their first game against Canadians. John Scott is a player on the amateur team representing Canada, the Toronto Lyndhurst. We didn't expect that level of play. We thought their equipment was shoddy. You know, they didn't look like real hockey players. But they could skate. 
They could really skate. They were in great condition. The Soviets win 7-2. The hockey world is stunned. In the depth of the Cold War, Canadians have been beaten by communists. It's a sharp slap in the face. I was devastated. The worst was hearing their anthem. I was crying. A lot of the other players were too. We felt terrible because we let our country down. We lost and it was a crime. Since the Winnipeg Falcons won the very first Olympic gold in 1920, Canadians have taken it for granted that they'll win every world and Olympic championship. They never saw this coming. The Russians uh, prepared for hockey the way they did for war games. And of course, uh, surprise was part of the strategy. On this side of the Atlantic, we Canadians uh, took hockey as our national sport. And being that, we thought we were at the same time invincible. So we couldn't care less about preparation. We thought we could beat them all the way we played the game, period. And the surprise came to us. The Soviets have been planning this for eight years. Right after the end of the Second World War, they set out to prove to the world that communism is the best system in all things, including hockey. They give the job to the Red Army. Captain Anatoly Tarasov is named player coach. It was the order of the Committee on Physical Education and Sports to start developing what we called Canadian hockey. In 1946, the Soviets don't know much about hockey, but they're great bandy players. It's a sport played with a ball on a rink the size of a soccer field. No body contact is allowed. The Red Army drafts bandy players to staff its new hockey teams. These soldiers train 11 months a year, determined to become the best hockey players in the world. Anatoly Kostrukov is one of the rookies. We didn't have any equipment to protect ourselves. No shoulder pads, no elbow pads, no knee pads, nothing. Our uniform and sticks were homemade. The Russians had to train under very tough conditions, and uh, therefore they trained almost 12 months a year. They were driven by a mission. On this side of the Atlantic, uh, hockey was part of the uh, professional sport issue, where money was everything. In Russia, uh, money was not a factor. It wasn't an issue. The issue was, and the only one, winning at any cost, as long as they served the ideals of communism. The Czechs will be the Russian hockey players' first masters. They are the best in Europe. In 1948, when Czechoslovakia is swallowed up behind the Iron Curtain, Czech hockey players are brought to Moscow. Red Army Lieutenant Sevolod Bobrov watches their every move. The Czechs were like brothers. They readily shared their secrets and techniques with us. They were very accomplished stick handlers. They really knew how to shoot and body check. We also learned a lot of other skills from our Czech friends. In a strange irony, the Czechs learned their game from Canadians, who brought hockey to Europe 20 years earlier. In the 1930s, the Canadians bring a style of play with them, uh, so that there are people like Mike Buckner who stay in Czechoslovakia to teach the game, to teach a style of the game, to coach the game. One year after the humiliating loss in Stockholm, Canadians are out to prove that they are still the best. This time, it's the country's top amateur team, the Allen Cup champions, British Columbia's Penticton Vs, that ends up facing the Soviets. Billy Warwick is their star player. The whole country was just wild, prayed and everything else for us to win. 
Be sure to win. Stay out of the penalty box. Beat them. Don't come home without it. The pressure was unbelievable. From Krefeld, Germany, it brings you the final game of the World Hockey Championships between Canada and Russia. On March 6th, 1955, in the small West German town of Krefeld, the Soviets and Canadians face off once more in the final game. George McAvoy, number three of Canada. Can Canada avoid another defeat? Of the Soviet team. It was politics. East against West and the Cold War, we knew we had to win. That's all there was. There was no way out. This is no time for diplomacy. The V's hit anything that moves. Sid Godber is covering the game for the Penticton Herald. As the goals came, so rose the tempo of the game. The Canadians checked harder and harder. The Russians seemed to be enjoying the game less and less. At the end, the Russians barely made an effort to cross over on the Canadian ice. Here they jam in there and rolls back to the blue line. Final score, five to zero, Canada. Canadian soldiers rush on the ice. Canada wins, but something's changed. It is no longer the only master of the sport it has created. The very next year, the Soviets regain the world championship by winning gold at the Olympics. The seeds of a great struggle have been sown. A titanic battle for hockey supremacy has begun. A battle that will produce some of the most thrilling and most painful moments in the history of hockey. <laughs>